Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Ford School. I'm Michael Barr, the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's my delight uh, to welcome you all here this afternoon uh, for policy talks at the Ford School, our first one uh, of the year. Our talk today is co-sponsored by the School of Information, the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, and the Program in Practical Policy Engagement. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Rosenworcel, our special guest, and Jack Bernard from the university's general counsel office. It's my honor to um, introduce them both, and I'm going to start with Jack, who will be hosting the dialogue with the commissioner. Jack is the University of Michigan's associate general counsel and a colleague of mine on the faculty of the law school. Jack has been with the General Counsel's Office since 1999, and along the way he's taught courses at law, the School of Information, the School of Education, and here at the Ford School. He received his JD from the University of Michigan Law School and his Master's in Higher Education from the U of M Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education. Jack is an expert on intellectual property, copyright, computing, and cyber right, and First Amendment and free speech, among other topics. Uh, I was also learning that uh, he has become temporarily an expert on dealing with special student problems at the beginning <laughs> of the year. Uh, I won't say anything more about that. Uh, Jack, thank you very much for joining us here. I'm very, very delighted to have you. Um, I'm also delighted uh, to introduce our featured guest, Federal Communications Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Commissioner Rosenworcel has over two decades of outstanding leadership in communications policy and public service. She was appointed to the FCC by President Obama in 2012 and reappointed by President Trump in 2017. Prior to joining the agency, she served as Senior Communications Counsel for the United States Senate Com Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. Her portfolio covered a wide range of communications issues, including spectrum auctions, public safety, broadband deployment and adoption, universal service, video programming, satellite and television, local radio, and digital TV. Before joining the committee, she served as legal advisor to former FCC Commissioner Michael Copps. And previously, she'd been in private practice. Commissioner Rosenworcel is a native of Hartford, Connecticut, and a graduate of Wesleyan University and New York University School of Law. The commissioner has a well-earned reputation in DC as a creative and tireless champion for opportunity, accessibility, and affordability in our nation's communications services. She coined the term homework gap to draw attention to the problem of growing inequality in school children's access to high-speed internet based on socioeconomic status and geography. This is, I believe, the commissioner's first visit to Ann Arbor. Is no, that right? Second. Second. Ha. Um, it was so good I came back. Awesome. <laughs> uh, but like uh, many of uh, people around the world, she has um, a special Michigan tie. Her mother was a student here, a uh, graduate of the University of Michigan. Um, so I will uh, uh, share our wonderful expression, go blue. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to um, have <laughs> Commissioner Rosenworcel here. And uh, please join me in thanking her for being here. So uh, let me just say a word about our process. Um, uh, in um, about 20, 25 minutes after the hour, staff will begin walking around the room to collect questions um, from those in the audience. And they'll compile questions from Twitter as well for those watching online. Uh, Jack will transition us into the Q&A, and the commissioner will take your questions. The Q&A will be facilitated by uh, Ford School um, postdoctoral fellow Molly Kleinman, who manages the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, along with Ford School students Jackson Voss and Lindsay Makochi, who are right here. Um, with that, uh, let me turn things over to Jack, and I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome again to Michigan. We're really happy to have you here, and you can see you've got a yeah. full audience. Oh, thank you. I thought we might start with talking a little bit about how you got here. I mean, I know, I, I know that the dean gave a, a little bit of your bio, but I'm yeah. wondering if you might share a little bit more about yourself. Um, 
You know, I was asked this question earlier by some students, and I think the way I put it was, there are those people who knew what they wanted to do from day one, and they took every job and took every class in service of that goal, and studiously reached that goal. I was not one of those people. <laughs> they didn't go like that. Um, I, uh, I came from a family of scientists, including my mother who went to graduate school here. And the most rebellious thing I thought I could do was go to law school. <laughs> so I went to law school. I found myself in Washington. I practiced there for a while. And I, I worked on the privatization of a publicly owned utility, which uh, if you spend some time studying economics and engineering and law is actually quite interesting. And shortly thereafter, I had an opportunity to join the junior staff of the Federal Communications Commission because a few years earlier, Congress had passed a law known as the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And there was a lot of work to do to implement that law. So I spent time on that. I eventually went to work for a uh, commissioner. And then I went to work on Capitol Hill, where I worked on issues involving the digital television transition, satellite service, and then worked with the Obama administration on securing more spectrum so first responders could talk to one another, an idea that eventually became law. And then I had the privilege of going to the agency to oversee the implementation of it, uh, where I learned quickly that implementing a law and just coming up with the idea are two different things. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, I, I think for so many in the room who are really thinking about a, a life in public service and doing public policy work, it's, it's great for them to see a little bit about what might be a rough and tumble path to get where, where maybe yeah. you really want to go. Well, you have to be open to the opportunities that come your way, and along the way cause just the right amount of trouble to make them happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you are a commissioner on the FCC right now, and I think people in the room have a, a generalized notion of what the FCC is, but I'm wondering if you might unpack that a little bit for us. Well, I'm totally biased, but the FCC oversees about one-sixth of our economy, communications and technology, and I think it is the most exciting sector of our economy. So that involves everything from broadcasting to broadband, from Wi-Fi to wireless, the satellite services in the air. If you think about it, you can't go through the day without touching some form of communications that the FCC oversees. And it's an institution that Congress created in 1934, back when it decided that on a day-to-day -day basis, they didn't think Congress should be the entity deciding how we divvied up our airwaves and managed radio service. Since that time, communications has just grown more and more important in all of our lives. And the FCC, is, as a body, makes decisions about communications service and public policy. And uh, Congress oversees us. But we have a lot of authority because there are a lot of issues before us. So how does, how does the FCC interact with the internet? How do we interact with the internet? If you think about the FCC, I think the easiest way to talk about it is we think about communications transmission. Our jurisdiction and our authority largely speaks to making sure there's a wire in the ground or there are airwaves that are allocated for wireless service or satellite service. And it's that transmission that's an input into everything we do in modern life. And that's where our authority primarily lies. So in, in anticipation of your arrival here, I, I'd been thinking about this for yeah. several weeks and started talking with people about the, the central theme of our, our talk today, which is probably going <laughs> to focus on net neutrality. So I started asking people in, in our community here what they thought about net neutrality. And what I discovered was that people have a wide range of conceptions about what ne net neutrality actually is. And some people have very, very strong feelings about things that I'm not actually sure are net neutrality. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you might give us a, a, at least a working definition yeah. of net neutrality, and perhaps if you could try to give us one that isn't laden with a particular viewpoint. We'll, we'll get <laughs> deep, to the, deep uh, into the viewpoints. Okay. But, um. All right, I'm going to try to be acronym and viewpoint free. We'll see if I <laughs> succeed, because that's a hard task for someone from Washington. Um, 
I think net neutrality means that your broadband providers have to treat the traffic on their networks equally with, so that they do not discriminate on the basis of source, destination, or content. Let me put that in better English. It means that you can go where you want and do what you want online, and your broadband provider does not make decisions for you. It means your broadband provider does not have the legal right to block websites, to throttle online services, or censor online content. So you used the word equally there, and mm -hmm. I'm just I'm wondering when you're when we're thinking about this, and now we're we're kind of leaving our definition, but yeah. um, what do you mean by equally? Well, non discrimination is what I mean by equally, which has been a principle of our communications and networks laws for a long time. I mean, so much so you don't even realize it, right? Like think back to the basic telephone network. It is a given that if you went to a wired phone on a wall, you can call whoever you want. And the telephone company can't decide you can't call that person, nor can they go in and edit your conversation. In other words, you have a non-discriminatory right to make that phone call, it's up to you. Those ideas transferred to the digital age are what I think about when I think about traffic and treatment with net neutrality, which is, again, you should be able to go where you want, regardless of source, destination, or the content you're seeking to access without the broadband provider getting in the way. So to me, we're really talking about non-discrimination, which has been a principle of our thinking about networks and communications for decades and decades. So I've noticed, though, that the different broadband providers I've engaged with, they provide different suites of services sure. or different speeds or a, a variety of other options. So my, my experience isn't uniform. Sure. Uh, so I'm wondering really what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I, you can get these things, I think, confused. but. It is perfectly acceptable for someone who doesn't do a lot of online activity to decide that they're happy with 200 kilobits speed. It's good for their email. You come to my <laughs> house and you got four people who are all trying to watch videos simultaneously, I'll pay for a gigabit. And I think that every consumer should have the right to make those choices, but they're making the choices your broadband provider's not making the choice for you. So how, how is it that um, in the absence of net neutrality, our broadband providers might interfere with your four video family <laughs> watching group um, in, enjoying videos online? I mean, what, yeah. what, what, what could they do well, that would undermine your experience? Here's what I know. Since we rolled back our net neutrality policies, our broadband providers have the legal right to block websites, to throttle online services, and censor online content. They have the right to go to any entrepreneur or creator that wants to put something online and say, hey, if you want to reach that customer, you got to pay us a toll. So after you give an entity that legal right, you have to ask this question as a matter of public policy. They have that legal right. Do they have the technical ability to do that? Yes, network management would allow them to do that. Do they also have the business incentive? Well, yes, if there's a greater revenue associated with those behaviors, charging more to reach certain websites, I'm sure they'd try to engage in it. And when you align a legal right with technical ability and a business incentive, over time, you expect that those behaviors will emerge in the marketplace. And by rolling net neutrality back, I think we did just that. I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good for con consumption or creation online. So one of the things that I think about when we, when we add regulations mm -hmm. to a system is that we've encumbered the system. And yes. I think a lot, a lot of uh, net neutrality detractors talk about the idea that when, when the FCC added regulations um, in f support of net neutrality, that actually the system became encumbered and that it was mm -hmm. working just fine beforehand. And mm -hmm. this was a, 
it wasn't a problem. The, the kinds of uh, behaviors you were talking about were rare and mm -hmm. not a normative thing. And wh why would we need to encumber mm -hmm. the system with regulations? Well, a few things. First, we had regulations in place, and that has a way of disciplining market actors. Mm -hmm. They make sure that they try to abide by them, and therefore we did not have a lot of violations. The second thing I would say is when you think about regulation, I think the question is how much oversight you want in a marketplace. I believe you need less oversight if you have a competitive marketplace. Competitive marketplaces are themselves the best regulator of activity. But when you look at the broadband marketplace, according to the FCC's own data, about half of the American public does not have a choice of broadband provider. That's not exactly competitive. And as a result, if your broadband provider decides to muck around with your traffic, block websites, or charge you a premium for reaching certain content, you can't pick up your business and take it elsewhere. There's nowhere else to go. And it's the absence of that competition that I think makes some light oversight from agencies like the FCC useful and necessary for consumers. So I want to dig a little deeper there because my own experience uh, with my broadband and cable provider mm -hmm. was that even when the net neutrality rules were in place, yeah. I felt those constraints you were just describing. Right. That is, my, my broadband provider only provided so much speed and yeah. only so many options, and I felt constrained by that because I really didn't have a lot of choices. Yeah. How is, this, how is that it's a, a net neutrality issue, issue though? Well, it's, um, to me, if the marketplace was robust and everyone had a handful of providers, they would compete to provide you all with the best service. And I do think they make an effort to do that now, but they would compete and perhaps compete on the basis of making sure your internet experience was as open and free as possible. But in the absence of having that many providers, we don't have that competition. And that's what net neutrality rules are designed to help manage, to make sure that consumers can go where they want and do what they want online, even in the absence of a fully competitive market. So what's this, what specifically changed when we rolled mm. back the net neutrality rules? What specifically changed? The FCC had in place rules that said you can't block, you can't throttle, you can't engage in pay for play prioritization, where you treat some traffic just fine because they pay you and consign the rest to a bumpy road. I don't think those policies were radical. They were radically popular. They'd also been upheld by the courts. Um, and. Uh, Speaking as an FCC commissioner, we don't always get the luxury of our rules being upheld by the courts. <laughs> so they were justified by judges, well received by the public, and they were stable. Uh, but we chose to roll them back anyway, and that was done over my dissent. Right, you, you, you were very vocal and um, you know, brought f forward arguments and, um, and were, were not able to persuade your, yeah. your fellow commissioners. <laughs> Uh, just yet, 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 yeah. <laughs> just deviating a little bit from where we were going. Yeah, right. Yeah. Although I'll come back. Okay. What's what is that like? What's the experience ah. of being of being the the holdout or or the lone dissenter? Mm. Well, I'm a Democrat in Washington right now, so I have a lot of experience with this. <laughs> um, look, I I firmly believe people don't remember what you said, but they remember how you said it. So you try to make your objections in a principled way. You try to find those arguments that will lead people on the margins to find your ideas compelling, and then you repeat them over and over and over again. And then when you've irritated people, you still repeat them and again and again. And I, I think you can make change over time if you do that. It's not a single act or a decision. And I think you know we were talking about this earlier. Net neutrality has become that. The FCC made what I believe is a misguided decision late last year. But millions of people wrote our agency. And in the wake of all of their anger about our decision, they did something about it. They went to governors. There are now six governors who require net neutrality in their state contracts. They went to mayors. There's more than 100 mayors who've committed to do the same. They went to state houses. And there are laws now in Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and Governor Brown in California may by the end of the month be signing another law. And they went to court. And in Congress, in the United States Senate, legislation was passed to overturn the FCC. 
And if you stand back and look at that swell of activity, that's democracy in action. That's people actually doing you know, what the system contemplated, which is participating in creating change. So I don't think the net neutrality story is over. And I have this optimism that if that continues, we can once again return internet openness to the law of the land. So how do you, you've had this uh, difference of view on a very mm -hmm. public matter. Uh, w whether or not people really understand it is still up for debate, I think. Mm -hmm. but, but you've had this real difference. How do you, how do you build collegiality yeah. after this kind of schism? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, it's one that you should probably ask everyone in Washington. I'll tell you how I do it. Uh, I, I try to decide whatever disagreement we had is like a book that goes on the shelf and I'm moving on to the next volume. And I try to find something with each of my colleagues I might be able to agree with on them. I have a colleague on the other side of the aisle. We do a lot of work together on unlicensed spectrum policy, trying to figure out which is a fancy way of trying to figure out how much more Wi-Fi we can put in our airwaves and uh, make a real effort to make sure that we can open a book together, even if we have other disagreements, that there's something that we can find agreement on. I think that's important. It doesn't always succeed, but you should keep trying. So hop hopping back into net neutrality, <laughs> and I know we took a little detour yeah. there, but I'm wondering if you would be willing to take a moment and to try to steel man as opposed to straw man mm -hmm. the position on the other side. Okay. Um, let's see. This is a good exercise. It feels <laughs> almost like academic, right? <laughs> um, Washington needs to be careful. It can over-regulate -re industries. It can come up with policies that are well-intended and the results can be harmful. We want our broadband providers to experiment and come up with packages and plans that serve everyone. And if, you know, taking revenue from online uh, platforms is an important part of that mix, or setting up services that only allow people to reach small portions of the internet could create more and different packages. We want them to have that freedom to experiment. We also want them to be able to raise enough revenue as private sector actors so that they can deploy their broadband networks further and in more places. I think that that would be the argument that would be made on the other side. Now I could pick apart what I just said. Mm -hmm. um, but if uh, I were still talking to you mm -hmm. as the, the person bolstering that view, and I said, well, how does net neutrality interfere with that? This is getting like really confusing what, what, what <laughs> place I made. Um, how will network? Yeah, oh God, I just don't think it will. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm being honest. That's all um, right. Uh, I think that there are questions about what's called zero net rating with that and how much experimentation you should allow providers to have uh, with respect to exempting certain websites or activities from online data caps. But now we're getting a few levels in, so. <laughs> All right, well, let, let, yeah. me, uh, let me let you become yourself again. Oh, I appreciate and, that. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I, I do think uh, yeah. it is important to be able to do what you just did, mm -hmm. because I think if you want to make progress uh, anywhere in right. Washington or on your, on your local transportation authority board, you, <laughs> you need to be able to understand what's driving the other side and, and to be able to distinguish dr politics as driving the other side or whether there is actually yeah. a fundamental principle You're that's at stake. totally right. I think you have to s pause and say, if I came to that position, as a decent individual, what, why, why, did I, why did I reach that result? You have to subject yourself to that discipline in order to make sure your arguments are tighter, but also because you might find some bridges if you subject yourself to doing that. So one thing I think we hear a lot from industry along these lines is that net neutrality is a, um, is a barrier to investing in infrastructure yes. and, it, and it's an it's a barrier because uh, with net neutrality the state I mean the government is essentially n nationalizing mm -hmm. w the investment of these individual uh, 
portions of the sector mm -hmm. um, who, are, who are trying to invest in infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, essentially creating a kind of easement mm -hmm. on, on spaces they've put forward. This mm -hmm. is the, the arguments yeah. that we've, we've heard. I'm wondering how you'd respond to that. Um, we, listen, we do have uh, broadband challenges in rural parts of this country. Mm -hmm. We've got about 24 million people in the United States without broadband, as we've defined it today. 19 million of them are in rural and remote communities. And instead of having theoretical arguments about net neutrality, I would like to map where those people are and identify how we're going to build support programs for the infrastructure and new technologies that is going to make serving them more feasible. When you say we, do you mean we the government or we? We as a nation, mm -hmm. collectively, both public sector and private sector actors. So do you think it's possible that um, along with advocating for net neutrality, you could advocate for incentives, for government incentives, for industry to do just Absolutely. those Absolutely. I think it is. Um, those two things are not inconsistent. Right. You can do both things at the same time. I think that is a false choice to present it as one or the other. So getting back to this idea of equality, could it not be the case that uh, maybe less than, than equitable service might actually be better for the whole? I mean, for instance, think about mm -hmm. things like uh, roads where we, we give a, uh, a preference uh, to some vehicles, perhaps mm -hmm. vehicles that are, are traveling with more than one person mm -hmm. in them, or at the grocery store, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's a line for cash and a line sure. for credit card. See, but here's the, the premise that mm -hmm. you have there. There are multiple lines. The okay. point is that there is a lane mm -hmm. for traffic with uh, people with you know, carpools, and there are several other lanes. That is something that is plausible in a market that is competitive enough to sustain multiple lanes. Mm -hmm. The fundamental problem with our broadband markets right now is even data from the FCC suggests it's not. So I think that that analogy has limitations when it comes to broadband service. Do the, do the limitations stem from the fact that there tends to be for each market, only one or potentially two I think that is providers? the most significant problem. So if there were a greater proliferation of competition, then would I we... I think we would revisit, revisit these questions, yes. And we might not need net neutrality? Uh, I think we would revisit whether it's necessary. Okay, well, that, that does make some sense. Um, so one of the things that uh, we frequent, frequently see pointed out by mm -hmm. people who are advocating for net neutrality is this idea that there would, there would form cartels of, of relationships of, yeah. of people across industries. So there would be the people who, there would be the, uh, the, the broadband providers who liked Netflix and the mm -hmm. ones who liked YouTube. Right. And, and right. that if you were with one, you'd get one service more quickly, and if you were yeah. with the other, you'd get, is, is there any evidence for that? Um, I think there's discussion, some of that is starting to happen. Uh, it doesn't preclude you from reaching the other, but you know, we're all super impatient. You know, that little circle of death comes up on your screen, mm -hmm. and I don't know about you, but I'm surprised at how swiftly I click off that and try to find something else. And even the slowest bits of throttling can change consumer behavior. And if you think about it, what you just described is also really, over time, corrosive for entrepreneurship. Who's that person who's going to come up with some new video site? How are they going to find a way to get into the marketplace when it's been divvied up between these major providers so that ordering your internet service is more like ordering your cable service where you choose channels? Uh, that's, I think the greater concern over time is for entrepreneurship and the inability to develop new services that may not be able to afford the premium that's paid for those sweet speeds that prevent you from having that little circle go round and round. I suppose that's, that, that uh, creates an obstacle for the argument for net neutrality because it's really difficult for, for most people to imagine the world a lot different than it is right now. Right. That's right. Absolutely. So okay. how do you overcome that? You know, it's hard. We can, I can point back to a whole bunch of small episodes where a voice over internet protocol provider was denied service, another time when Google Wallet and FaceTime were not available on certain services. But the truth is, with consumer pressure and net neutrality laws in place, we were able to override those 
on a going forward basis, I think my agency has denied itself the authority to fix those problems. And I have concern that absent our pressure combined with consumer pressure, uh, it won't be so easy to do so in the future. One challenge, given the people in the room here, is that everyone here, or just about everyone here, has access to really high speed uh, technology through the university. Town, right? right? I mean, if you look on a map of the United States, some of the best broadband is in big university towns. For research, the number of young people, I mean, you, peop you, you all use it <laughs> in ways that are not available to so many other places in the country, and it's almost hard to fathom. But, you know, I've been in schools where the students can't all get online at the same time to take some standardized tests because it will overwhelm the system. And I, I've been in towns where there are kids who are just, you know, sitting outside uh, the library late at night because they can't get service up the road where they are at home just to get online. And these things are happening in the United States right now. I feel like if we can create this abundance here, we must be able to figure out support systems and technologies that help get it everywhere. It is a big problem. Yeah, the, the only time I ever notice a real drag on the system is during football games. Uh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Maybe you're not the only one. <laughs> so uh, I think a, a, rare, a rare thing has happened, um, and maybe it won't be rare in mm -hmm. the future, but in that lots of Americans now know the name of the chair of the FCC. I know, right? <laughs> What's that like? Isn't that strange? Yeah. I think that's strange. <laughs> you know, I like a little anonymity. I'm okay with it. Um, you know, in one, in one way, on a personal level, I like a little Anna. It's okay. Uh, it's not me. But then on another level, I think, well, that's terrific. Because otherwise, we're just making decisions without public input. And we'll get some big industry over here that wants this. And maybe an industry on the other side that wants that. But what's terrific right now is that the public is starting to understand the work of the agency, and they're speaking up. They're letting us know. And I think it's incumbent on public sector actors like myself to figure out how to talk about these things without drowning it in uh, industry-specific language and academic terms, and figuring out how to make it accessible so that a broader swath of the United States gets to participate in decision making in Washington. I think that's really important. And so there's upside to people knowing who we are and what we do. And it actually leaves me a little excited to realize that that's true. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming out here, even though you prefer a more an anonymous approach. <laughs> but I, I think it, it, it is really important for yeah. people to, to be able to engage. Right. Um, I'm wondering. Do you, have you noticed, will there be any, um, because you're out speaking out mm -hmm. against the posture that your, your colleagues took, it, does, does that create consequences? Um, sure. I mean, people prefer going to any room. Someone's going to like you better if you agree with them. I mean, that's the way things go. But I look at what's happening in Washington right now, and I think you've got to speak out, and you've got to speak out consistently on the things you think are most wrong, and this is one of them. So I, I brought us to the discussion of, of uh, Chairman Pai, and I'm interested in news mm -hmm. that took place recently. As, as uh, maybe lots of people in the room know, both houses in California p passed a net neutrality-like bill for California. Mm -hmm. And um, within the last couple of weeks, actually within the last couple of days, uh, Chairman Pai took a very strong position against that, re really suggesting that, that California was uh, illegally flouting federal law. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering two things. Yeah. One, what you, <laughs> what you make of that statement, and two, what you think about the California proposal. Um, OK. First, listen, he's a, he's a nice individual. I have pretty fundamental disagreements with him on some things like this. With respect to California, I think I alluded bef before that I'm excited. I see democracy in action in state legislatures getting involved. I do think the FCC is in a strange legal position when it comes to issues of preemption with the states. And I don't think you need a law degree to understand this, but I'm going to talk about preemption for a second. The agency in its decision late last year said, oh, we don't have authority. We made a mistake before to have these net neutrality rules. 
I'm going to roll them back. We can't possibly do this because we don't have authority. I disagree with that. But if the position is you don't have authority, you also don't have the right to then go tell the states they too don't have authority. Because by virtue of you choosing to exit this area of the law, you don't get the right to preempt others. And I think that there's some cognitive dissonance in that position that it needs some explaining. Do you, do you, I mean, I was trying to figure out uh, really what he was getting at. What was the elite? <laughs> Apparently, what was I'm the, not the only one who could cognitive dissonance, yeah. I, uh, I was yeah. wondering whether he was going to make an, a, a kind of First Amendment argument, that somehow mm -hmm. this was going to be a, a constraint on the ability of corporations to yeah. facilitate communication in some way, that where a state might, like California, might overstep. I, yeah. I, I couldn't figure it out. I think it's more about Commerce Clause. Listen, we're now living in a universe where these interstate networks are so important to what we do. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do we have a mix of federal authority and state consumer protection that manages these kind of services? And I don't think we have the digital age jurisprudence to fully manage that mm -hmm. right now. And so I, that's something that I see his position he's trying to articulate. Um, we might come out in different places on it, but I think that that is certainly an issue, and I respect that he has some concerns about it. Before we leave net neutrality, I, I was wondering if you might uh, help the audience at least be able to describe your view in a, in a, in a pithy way. How would, you, yeah. how would you summarize your yeah. view so that when people go home to dinner and say, I just went to this amazing talk today, I love seeing government in action, and here's what <laughs> I learned. Uh, I think I said it earlier, just you should be able to go where you want and do what you want without your broadband provider making choices for you. All right. Well, we, That's I'm, an almost bumper sticker, right? <laughs> so I expect we'll get some questions yeah. about that. I want to, if, if it's okay with you, I want to stroll into a few, sure. uh, a few other areas. Um, so the FCC thinks, uh, has thought uh, uh, for at least 30 years about consolidation of, mm. of media. And I've, and I've noticed a change uh, of late in that posture. And I'm wondering whether you could unpack that issue for us a little bit and then talk about what your thoughts are. Yeah. Uh, look, media's changed, right? Um, there was a time, some people in this room are too young to recall, when you got the news in the morning in newsprint on your doorstep. And if you wanted the news at night, you turned on the TV and um, three guys with really good hair <laughs> could deliver <laughs> it to you. And that was it. I mean, I don't think, I can't even fathom that now, right? We expect to get whatever information we want, wherever we want it, on any screen handy. Uh, that cycle's exhausting, but it's also changed the media business. And in many ways, FCC policy, which oversees some cable systems and broadcast stations, struggles to keep up. But I think that you can have different responses to that. And of late, the FCC's response has been, well, we should let there be more consolidation. Because these older forms of media need more heft and scale to compete with everything that's new. Um, I understand the thinking behind that response, but I ultimately reject it. I think we need more competition among news organizations that have journalists that go dig stuff up. And I'm worried that despite all the commentary we have out there in citizen journalism, we actually have less, particularly when it comes to local news. So I'm concerned about the consolidation that we have allowed among broadcasting, though I respect that their model needs some updating for digital times. So the, the concern the uh, FCC had had about consolidation was that if there were too many media outlet local in a local area yeah. controlled by the same party, that there wouldn't be enough uh, so diversity. So I'll give you an example. Yeah. yeah. That'd be um, great. Uh, so just imagine a market. We'll just say Detroit, just for interest. <laughs> uh, so there used to be policies that said. The newspaper couldn't own any of the television stations or radio stations. There used to be policies that said no company could own like half the stations in the market. 
Uh, there used to be policies that restricted owning simultaneously the newspaper, half the stations, and the radio stations. We got rid of them. So local media is struggling. We should let them achieve more scale. Um, there's certainly, like I said, an argument that, that might help them, but I think your objective isn't so much helping them. Your objective is how do you sustain diverse viewpoints? And as the healthiest economies and civil societies are ones with many viewpoints, and by reducing the number of owners of some of those stations and newspapers, I don't know that we've contributed to diversifying news points. We've just consolidated them. Do you, uh, do, well, I guess, what do you think are going to be the next uh, steps along those lines? And, and how uh, should we be thinking about yeah. government stepping in in this instance? Well, there are congressional laws that constrain a company from nationally owning more than, I think it's 39%. Uh, broadcast reach for television households, and there are questions about whether or not that threshold should be raised. There are also questions about whether or not Congress should do it or the FCC should do it. And all of this might feel real tethered at a distance from your reality, but all of this sort of feeds into the system of journalism through which we get local news. Because for all the diversity of news sources we reach out to today, all the data suggests that most Americans in this country still get their local news from television and radio. So we've got to figure out how to make sure that those sources remain strong, because learning what's happening in our communities really helps us be good citizens. So over the last at least year, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. shifting again to something else, over the last year we've heard the president uh, suggest the possibility of revoking uh, the license of a, a particular yeah. media company, NBC yeah. in particular. Um, and purportedly this is because there is criticism, maybe it's felt that that criticism is unwarranted of the president or the administration. Um, that's come up a number mm -hmm. of times. How, how realistic is that, uh, is that kind of a threat? And I guess I, I'm hoping yeah. that you can yeah. un unpack that for us as well. All right, we're going to try to find a diplomatic way to do this. <laughs> Let me take you back about a year ago mm -hmm. when I think that threat was first thrown over the uh, Twitter sphere. This is actually funny. I, I'd, um, I brought in a new media policy advisor that day or the day before. <laughs> and I did what I normally do in the morning, which is like drink too much coffee, comb through my email, see what news is available on Twitter see something the president's written, I'm like, oh, that's not right. It's not right on so many levels. It's completely, you know, it's, we've got constitutional problems. We don't license networks. We only license individual stations. And, you know, I took a swig of my coffee and then just pecked out on Twitter in response. <laughs> okay. I think my office thought I was drinking something stronger than coffee. But anyway, um, I wrote, not how that works. And then, like, any kind of Wonk, I linked to the, uh, I think, 34-page single-spaced FCC manual on broadcast licensing. <laughs> and, that's true. And, uh, and somewhere over the morning, it's like thousands and thousands of people are there. And then, you know, suddenly, like, these, like, cable news networks on the phone, will you come and talk about this? Will you come and talk about this? Uh, but in many ways, I think it was a, you know, a story about what's to come, antagonism, towards the news, and I think it's troubling because it's not just about politicians criticizing the news media. I mean, that's as old as time. Uh, we had the Alien and Sedition Acts shortly after we were founded. President Kennedy described the uh, news as his natural enemies. Uh, there's no shortage of episodes in our history where you see administrations complaining about news and journalists. So let's treat that as something that is not uncommon. But what worries me most is when you have government use the tools of its power to try to check on the media that covers whether or not you're abusing that power. And that you don't want government using its tools to prevent media from serving as a check on power. You want media to have the ability to cover. And I think in that threat to take away a license while unfocused and inaccurate and wrong, 
I think you see that problem, and that leaves me concerned. So in the 2016 election, data, data came out, and somewhere around 17% of people under 30 voted, Some, somewhere in that neighborhood. I know the numbers vary a little bit, depending upon which study you look at. But it suggests that, that people, and maybe many people in this room, feel disenfranchised mm -hmm. and, and don't, don't feel a part of uh, we the people making a difference in our, in our own process, even, even in the voting booth. As, as people are thinking uh, in this room are thinking about trying to m make a difference, I'm wondering if you have mm -hmm. thoughts. Maybe, ha maybe they have strong views about net neutrality. Maybe their views have evolved since, since the discussion started. Um, what, what can they do yeah. To, to make a difference, and also, how can they feel as if the things that they're doing might have a chance of making a difference? Yeah, um, well, I don't have time for anyone's cynicism. I'm a public servant. I like to say I'm an impatient optimist, and I think it's a good way to be. You've got to decide that if you don't speak up, who will? If you don't vote, who will? It has, in many ways, never been easier to build a movement we have this online recess, the internet, that part of this is about. We've got a capacity to organize and make noise now that is unprecedented in human history. I think as citizens, we need to use it. I don't just want to be lobbied by the biggest corporations in Washington. I want to hear what people think in the middle of the country. And I think there is nothing stopping everyone here from having a bigger voice in Washington. They just got to choose to exercise it. Well, that's great. I can see that we got a whole bunch of questions that came in, and I want to give us a, an opportunity f uh, to answer those questions. And so I will tee it up to our student team to, to, to take the voice of the people. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jackson Voss. I'm a student here at the Ford School, uh, and I'm a member of the STPP certificate program, also here at the Ford School. Hi, and I'm Lindsay Machaki. I'm a chemistry PhD candidate as well as being a student in STPP at the Ford School. We have a few questions from the crowd. Uh, you mentioned this earlier in one of your answers, uh, the, the last mile uh, internet issue. The number that the person here gave is 30 million Americans without mm -hmm. reliable high-speed internet. I've heard much higher numbers mm -hmm. and I've heard varying numbers. Mm -hmm. um, but with respect to this problem, and especially when we're talking about rural tribal lands, and mm -hmm. also the people who live in urban areas who also don't have reliable access to uh, high-speed internet, what, what needs to be done to connect these people? Uh, and the second part of this question is, would this gap exist, or would this gap be as big of a problem if we treated the internet more like a traditional utility? Mm -hmm. um, so my numbers are from my agency, 24 million people without broadband. That's unacceptable. You don't have a fair shot at modern life. Most of them are in rural America, but not all of them. Some of them are in urban communities. And if you ask me, one of the things we should really do as a nation with more accuracy and aggression is something pretty simple. We need to map where broadband is and is not in every community in this country. We even need to make it like a citizen's project where we all participate. And we don't just say whether or not we get service at our home. We all actively hold up our phones and report how many bars we have. What if we like crowdsourced all of that information and we had it with greater accuracy than all the commercial companies that now offer that data to us? Because if we did, we would know with some precision where service is not and what kind of technologies we can address it with. Is it just extending that last mile and making sure a fiber facility reaches further? Or are you dealing with a community that is so far out that we're going to have to look at other technologies and services to reach them? I think that that is an important part of making sure we have success. It sounds really basic, but I think it would be really helpful. One of you could start broadband force. Yeah, I like it. Get out there and do it. All right, so another question. What is the relationship between net neutrality and the current rollback of net neutrality and the privacy of consumer content, including metadata about source and destination and not just the content? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, these are two things that are just pulsing in Washington right now. 
you can watch in real time Congress try to figure out what to do with privacy policy and Europe making decisions contemporaneously and California just passed another bill. There's a lot of pressure in Washington to identify what modern privacy policy will look like. Now, with respect to the FCC, there is a little bit of a relationship. It does not touch on the social media platforms, but Congress at the start of 2017 uh, took away our authority to make decisions about broadband privacy. That was regrettable. So now I've, I'm left with a lot of authority to make decisions about telephone call privacy, but not broadband privacy. And I hope, no matter where we go or what we do, that we're going to come up with policies that are simple enough all of us can understand them. Because right now, despite what I do professionally, if you read through the privacy policy on any individual website, I mean, it's torture. And I do this professionally. And then you know, you're know you asked to tick a box, and boy, if you don't read it, you can tick a box and get free shipping. So there it goes, right? And I don't think I'm all that abnormal. So uh, my hope, despite that description of my online ordering, <laughs> <laughs> my hope is that we can figure out ways to align our privacy policy across sectors of the economy. So that whatever you expect from a website has something to do with what you expect from your broadband provider and is simple enough that none of us need to be engineers or lawyers to understand it. We have a couple of questions, I think, that are of particular interest to people here in Michigan uh, relating to DSRC mm -hmm. uh, and connected vehicles. Um, one of the first questions is uh, about whether or not the Internet of Things and connected devices and connected vehicles changes the conversation around net neutrality. But the more specific question is actually about when is the FCC planning to decide between 5G and DRSC uh, as it pertains to yeah. the, its okay. regulatory All uh, right. structure. All right, for the non-spectrum and non-automotive nerds in the room. Uh, dedicated short-range communication service, a technology that with the auto industry, the FCC dreamed up in 1999 or set aside spectrum for in 1999. Um, wow, a lot's happened since 1999. I mean, if you told me about self-driving cars back then, I wouldn't have believed you. And yet, you know, you've got M City up the road, things being tested here. We're using LIDAR and radar and cameras and all of these new kind of spectrum bands to try to figure out how to have cars talk to one another. It's actually extremely exciting for this region of the country and for anyone who's on the road. Um, the questions are is does that old service from 1999 still have viability? According to the National Transportation Safety Board, it's going to be a few decades before we could have DSRC in every car, which is a technology that allows cars to talk to one another. So the question is, between now and then, what should our spectrum policy be? Uh, I have spoken about this before. Uh, most nations have set aside less spectrum for DSRC. I think it's possible that we could look at that band and try to see if we can accommodate some portion of it for Wi-Fi, some portion of it for auto safety. Uh, at the very least, we should start some testing in the lab to see if those things are viable. Above all, I don't think we should sacrifice safety, but I also don't think we can leave our spectrum policies stranded in 1999. And I really think that the goal here is not to decide where we're heading, but to do some smart tests in the lab to try to understand what modern auto safety technology looks like with this spectrum and whether or not there can be other uses that are nearby. Should we be narrowing the spectrum of, of any particular uh, industry right now? Oh, well, that's a loaded question. I mean, well, just bec because there is only so much spectrum, right? I mean, yeah. so we, ha we have okay. choices to make, and, right. and you talked about potentially expanding some. Where, where would we cut? Okay, um, so this is um, the two-minute version of the history of spectrum regulation. <laughs> Ready? <laughs> we used to set aside our airwaves, think of it as zoning in our skies, for very specific uses. Here, you can do this, you can broadcast only. Here, you can do this for auto safety. Here, you can do this for radio. But then we decided, you know what? Maybe we should do less of that setting aside for specific purpose. I mean, maybe I don't know what every airwave should be used for. And we should start auctioning off for flexible use. As long as we can manage your interference, can we just let the marketplace figure it out? That worked out pretty well because you all have a mobile device in your pocket. <laughs> And it's based on that principle. 
Now going forward, the problem is, oh my gosh, everyone wants some. Like you said, you've got these laws of physics. Can you, can you overwhelm them and suddenly do more with our airwaves? Well, yeah, we're experimenting with really high millimeter band airwaves that don't propagate far but have lots of capacity, would require many more sort of micro towers. I, I think what we actually have to do is get much more creative about sharing and come up with things like dynamic frequency sharing. So think about it this way. Instead of saying this spectrum is for your wireless phone or uses and this is for Wi-Fi, what if we created like a hierarchy of rights? Said, you know, this use is such a priority, it involves safety or national defense, you get preemptive right. If someone's not using it, maybe we can license off a secondary right. And then maybe if no one's using it still, could we have opportunistic use for Wi-Fi? In other words, we're not going to expand the, the physics, but can we be more efficient with the ways we distribute our airwaves? And I'll take it even another step further. We could do that with um, databases, or we could even look at new distributed ledger technologies like blockchain. So there, that's super buzzy. <laughs> um, but I do think we're going to have to start evolving spectrum policy to think about it. But we got to recognize there are some public safety uses that are going to be primary, but maybe we can come up with systems of rights that are not just exclusively you or them, mm -hmm. but create opportunities for all of us to quite literally share the road. So, so at times then, if in, in that model, in that kind yeah. of hybrid model where, where lots of us are using the, the same frequencies, I, I might get throttled back. Well, we're going to create terms of use, you know, spectrum that would manage your expectations in mm. those environments mm -hmm. that are different. Um, and when you use unlicensed spectrum, like for instance, if you use the 2.4 gigahertz band here to connect, you might have the expectation you'd fall off the Wi-Fi. There are, so, there are different services that you build different expectations for. Neat. Mm -hmm. right, so our next question is, what is your perspective on local publicly owned broadband, such as what's in Chattanooga, and what mm -hmm. role do you think that could play in ensuring an accessible and open internet? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So what's the future of municipal broadband? Uh, and about half the states in this country, the state legislature has prohibited it. I think that's regrettable. It's not that it's easy or the right solution for every jurisdiction. It's expensive to finance, construct, and maintain a network. That's, there's a reason that there are experts in that. It's, it's hard stuff, and every city or state may not be up to that task. But I am struck by this. We've got some communities in this country that feel that they do not have adequate broadband service. It's like the train passing them by in another era. They're not going to be able to sustain their economic future if they don't do something. And if their inclination is to come together just like their forebears did to build roads or bridges or barns, maybe it's broadband is wholly consistent with that. And I think for those who feel like the digital era is passing them by and they need some solution, I think it's unfortunate that those state laws largely prohibit them from doing so. All right. Uh, delving back into some net neutrality related questions, because we have several. Um, we, have, we have some questions from people, I think, who are, are wondering about whether or not uh, the ability to charge for, for internet service providers to charge could be uh, of some utility. Mm -hmm. So the question specifically is based on the infrastructure analogy, what, what makes a toll for an internet passage if you were gonna use the toll to pay for cybersecurity different from paying for infrastructure, for example? And also, why shouldn't providers be able to charge a little to distribute things that they, that, that uh, so one thing, one, one example that we got is uh, for pornographic websites, uh, which ha make up a massive amount of the internet. Um, uh, shouldn't providers be able to charge a little to distribute this kind of stuff is the question. I think you're going to always come up with use cases that seem plausible, but the problem is the ones that seem plausible to you may not seem plausible to them or him or her. And what you really want in the end is the consumer to have full control of their online experience and we are ceding a lot of authority to our broadband providers to allow them to make that decision. And in an environment where we, they don't have a lot of competition, 
I'm not sure we want to give them that authority and control and not have a voice in it. Hey, before you, you dive in uh, mm -hmm. with the next question, I, I, you, you talked about this before and I just want to tease it out a little bit because I mm -hmm. do think we already don't have a lot of control. I mean, right. we, we have, we have yeah. the service provider that we have. I think what you're saying is, and you should correct me, okay. please, um, is if, if uh, we don't have net neutrality to provide some signposts, some guidance, mm -hmm. some constraint, what we have every reason to expect is that over time, broadband providers will do things that create economic advantage, like sure. forming relationships and speeding up some traffic and slowing down other yes. traffic. And I think the, the challenge for us right now is, while there are, there are individual examples mm -hmm. of, of people doing that, we haven't, either we haven't noticed it that much, or we're, we're just counting on the fact that people will behave the way that we, ex or companies will behave the way we expect them to. I think that's fair. Yeah. So this is, I think this is why this is a hard, it's hard to make the net neutrality argument right. when you're sitting across the table from somebody sure. because they're saying, I don't, I don't see fire and brimstone here. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about this earlier that the University of Massachusetts and Northeastern University, they're now doing some testing, having lots of people, including I think students, download an app to try to test how fast they can get to certain video websites. Does it indicate reasonable traffic management, which would entail treating like services the same? Or does it involve some kind of bias for or against certain content? And you know, this is an interesting university campus to try to do that kind of experimenting on as well. And it's important that we as consumers and as citizens start paying attention to those things and developing ways to test what's happening. Another thing I'll mention just along these lines is you, you, when you think about how we don't have an enormous amount of evidence that, that this is how companies will conduct themselves, you do have to take some time to imagine what it will be like if they already have. Yeah. That is, in a world where th they're unconstrained, and now when the government comes in and says, oh, it turns out we're seeing the problems that we might have anticipated, mm -hmm. Now it looks a whole lot more like a taking because yeah. they've invested and the infrastructure has changed and it becomes disruptive and legislation. You know what gets even harder regulation. is as we've transferred some oversight for this to the Federal Trade Commission, mm -hmm. their tool is to take someone to court. I've at least got sort of the ability to make rules and say, you can do this, you can't do this. But taking someone to court is addressing the harm after it's occurred. And the judicial system doesn't move all that fast. <laughs> And like if you're a small website or a small business, I mean, do you have the resource, time, and energy to come to Washington, go file a complaint with the FTC, follow up, identify if it's something that is similar to other complaints they've received such that you can put pressure on them to go to the judicial system and get you resolution, which might take two years. Like to me, that's irrational for small businesses in this country. And just setting up a clear set of rules works a lot better for them. So it's another reason I think there's a pro-business side to having net neutrality rules in place that's underappreciated. We talk strictly about broadband providers and infrastructure, but we should also recognize that small businesses rely on online activity and online growth in ways that are extraordinary, and we should seek to create public policy to grow. Sorry for jumping in again. All right, so we have um, a few questions here that are kind of all related to the fake news conversation. So does the FCC have any role in regulating accuracy and truth on the internet? No. It, okay. <laughs> Get that out. Great. Yeah. Check that yeah. one out. Yeah. Um, no. So but in the wake of the net neutrality discussion, so why shouldn't internet service providers have the right to block um, concerning or offensive content or yeah. fake news? And kind of the flip side of that are what are the implications of not having net neutrality if they do choose to exercise that power on freedom of speech and equal access of information? Yeah, the first question was easy. The second ones are really sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so much of our town square right now takes place digitally. And we have offered a lot of control and authority to online platforms. 
And I think we would compound some of the problems we have by offering them that same authority to our broadband providers to choose where we can go and what we can see and what we can't see. Even if that authority is exercised with the best of intentions, we'll get rid of disinformation, we'll get rid of fake news. I don't have full confidence that they can exercise that appropriately under all circumstances. And um, I worry about providing them with that authority and it would be that it constrains all of our ability to go out and get the information we're looking for. This is why we teach critical thinking at the yeah. University of Michigan, is so you have the opportunity to decide for yourself when you need more information. Yeah. Uh, maybe if we can proliferate a little more of that, it, it will be productive yeah. for society. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. This next question comes to us from Twitter. Uh, and our, this question concerns um, corporate mergers, mm. such as AT&T and Time Warner, yeah. where internet service providers are uh, also becoming content and distribution and production companies as well. How does, how does net neutrality change the implications of these kinds of mergers? Mm, okay, uh, good question. I should say at the outset, the, it was the Department of Justice that reviewed that transaction, so I didn't have a role. But what you're seeing is the combination of distribution and communications and content. So if you think about it, with net neutrality, they couldn't create ways in which that distribution was biased towards their own content because that would be treating content in a discriminatory way. But now, without net neutrality policies in place, there's a lot of corporate incentive to make sure your network is biased towards the content that your company owns, downloads faster, is exempt from data caps, is offered to you free of charge. And so your viewership of it might increase and your viewership of other voices, other content might decrease. So I do think there's a net neutrality conversation to be had there and that the combination of content and distribution has consequences, especially in a world without net neutrality in place. All right, so next question is kind of playing off of California's net neutrality, mm -hmm. but asking if this was from the internet service providers, do you think it is possible, and is it possi possible functionally and legally for an internet service provider to say we are going to provide net neutrality to certain consumers, either for a fee or based on some sort of bias? Um, so, con so this would be a world in which net neutrality was available to all of us but for a fee. Uh, I believe that they would have the right to do that since the FCC changed its policies. Uh, the California law you described would make that complex in California. I'm pretty sh sure a court is going to sort all of that out. <laughs> Not me right here, but yes. Sorry, just checking the time. Um, so we have a couple of questions about uh, encouraging broadband broadband mm. competition mm -hmm. uh, in your view what are what are some ways that broadband competition could be encouraged uh, from the perspective of the FCC but also I think just more in general uh, we need to be identifying every way we can encourage competition and some of them are really mundane but consequential every state in the country should have dig once policies which means when you rip up the roads you should make sure that everyone knows so that they can lay down fiber facilities at that one time. It turns out it only adds 1% to the cost of construction projects, but by virtue of making it known to everyone that they can lay fiber facilities down, we can radically increase the likelihood that there's more competition over time. Because ripping up the road is expensive, so take advantage of ongoing road construction. We've made some changes to our access to telephone poles, again, these are not the sexiest issues, <laughs> but figuring out how to make sure other providers can get access to them, not just the incumbents, and make sure that they can do it with a minimum of bureaucracy will increase opportunities for competition. But I think the biggest and most consequential ones come with technology change because the economics behind network deployment right now are pretty hard. You know, If you've got millions and millions of people in a square mile, I'm pretty convinced that the cost per serving every one of those customers is manageable. But you move to a rural location, it becomes harder and harder for business cases to be made to serve all those customers. 
And so the FCC has some support systems to try to help those providers to make it more um, financially viable. But over the long haul, we're going to need new technologies. And I do think that fifth generation wireless, you probably hear about 5G all the time, is probably going to have many times more the capacity that our current wireless has right now and will become a more viable competition to traditional home broadband. I think that is probably the most exciting thing on the landscape for broadband competition, but it's not satisfying because it's still a little far off. So our next question um, asks about how closely the FCC Commission works with network engineers when you are determining your policy. We do have a pretty big office of engineering and technology, but I believe it's not big enough. I actually advocated for several years in front of an organization, first in front of an organization, the IEEE, so engineering organization, that the agency needs to start an engineering honors program, which is like go to schools like this one and say, can we entice you to come for a two-year tour of duty in Washington as an engineer? Um, and bring in young engineers and cycle them through. And maybe they'll go off and do other exciting things in industry over time, or they'll continue in public service. But we got to find more on-ramps to bring engineers into government across the board. We need more digital natives serving in government. We need more people who see opportunities with digital technology and not just sort of new bureaucratic headaches for new systems. Uh, we need more. All right. I think this will be our last question for the evening. Um, in your opinion, could internet access be considered a human right? Mm -hmm. uh, if so, what would be the argument for that? Yeah, this is a question I feel like you get asked from some time to time. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure how you classify it matters so much as this. You do not have a fair shot at prosperity in the 21st century if you do not have access to the internet. And I think if we can agree on that proposition, that is the most important thing. So figuring out how we get more people connected in more places at higher speeds in ways that are open, I think is going to be the ticket to our civic and commercial success in the future. And it needs to be a focus of our national policymakers across the board. Well, thank you so much. You've really been indulgent with your time and with yeah. your conversation partner. Such good questions. Well, we, we really yeah. appreciate you, you coming out. Thank you. And please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. <laughs>